Okay, good evening, Internet. We're going to discuss Susan Wolf's book slash lecture, um, Meaning in Life and Why It Matters. And just to get our discussion going tonight, uh, if, you, if you watched the Camus episode, I brought in this book. So again, I want to bring in this book just to give us some leading questions to get into discussion. I asked... We're going to ask four questions. Three of them we've already discussed amongst each other, and we're going to ask the fourth one on air to start our discussion in meaning in life. So the first three questions we I asked already, and everyone wrote down their individual answers, were number one, uh, what is one of your guilty pleasures? Either like something like a bad television program or a secret romance novel habit or something similar. So now is our time to share our guilty pleasures. And I'll, I'm still, I'll start because I kind of I took a cheap route. I wrote uh, Puzzles and Dragons was one of my guilty pleasures. Uh, that, that it, qualifies. Yeah, I, if you don't know Puzzles and Dragons, it's a it's a, like a little puzzle. It's like game. It's, it's like Candy Crush for Japan. Basically, yeah, it's like Candy Crush for Japan. Yeah, uh, and I definitely considered that a guilty pleasure, but I just could not stop playing that game for the longest time. So, anybody yeah. else want to share? Jim, uh, sure, sure. Mine is is yay, reading idle blogs. <laughs> oh wow. Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, look, this is uh, we just got a, a brand new blog I posted said four hours ago, uh, written by Umeda Ayaka. I will read this once we're off air. Nice, nice. I uh, I have by far the most embarrassing one. It's three. So, um, first one is the most devastating though. I watch American Idol. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Wow. I watch American Idol. Is my kick I, button still working? Oh, no. <laughs> no you can't kick me out. Um, <laughs> I'm leading this one, so you can't actually kick me out. Um, also, I watch those um, YouTube compilations on Japanese TV where they they just write, they just show a bunch of YouTube clips. Yeah, me too. And um, I also, actually, of all, the, all three of these, this might be the one I'm most interested in, is I watch those... Silly crime reenactments on Japanese TV, and I actually kind of enjoy that. So, yeah, uh, that is fun though. It is fun. Yeah, they're they're quite silly though. Um, so, right. Oh, good. Let's get into that. Let's get into that because that's our second question. The second question is, uh, if you feel guilty about it, why do you keep doing it? Uh, and just I'll just say what I wrote for Puzzles and Dragons. I said, well, just it's fun. It's a break from the day. It's relaxing. It's a chance to just space out for me and not have to think about anything really. That's what I used it for. Mm. Yeah. For and I guess I'll just keep going more with me for my reading my idle blogs. Uh, it allows me me to to escape from my own wor world and somehow feel connected to. Another world, the lives of the of these people, well, that I perceive as more appealing than my own life. Well, okay, mine is going to be the worst again. Um, again, for the most part, I use these to relax um, and to spend time with my wife, right, watching TV together. But uh, I'll admit it, I enjoy seeing people fail. Yes, I enjoy seeing people in pain. It gives me a chance to laugh at other people with my wife instead of, you know, her laughing at me. Um, so, uh, and I, you know what? I also enjoy seeing people in crazy situations. Mm. Just weird, unexpected situations, right? And seeing how they react to the absurd or something like that. Oh, right, well, that's good. That's a good answer. Okay. Uh, so the third question is this, then. Uh, on the other hand... If it's something you enjoy and it's not immoral, why do you feel guilty about it to begin with? And um, I guess for me, I feel really guilty about Puzzles and Dragons because it doesn't amount to anything. 
I, when I'm done with it, as soon as I, you know, beat the dungeon, I run out of gems, I, it's very empty. It feels like nothing has really gotten done in the last two hours, and I'm just waiting to waste more time. Mm. Yeah, pretty much the same over here. As much as, as I, you know, enjoy a hearing about, uh, you know, with, you know where Fuji Arena found, found and the next outfit she's going to wear, wear her next photo shoot. But I honestly don't. It's not like I actually remember for what store it was. I don't go to the store, to the store, or or nothing comes of to it. Yeah, just like you, it's simply a complete waste of time. Mm. Same same answer for me. Actually, I I feel like it doesn't add to my life or understanding of my life in any significant way. And I don't remember anything that I've done or seen two days later. Honestly, I mean nothing. Yeah, literally nothing. Yeah, wow, me too. I can't. Yeah, I can barely. I can't remember any of my time playing Puzzles and Dragons. None of it. It's gone basically. Um, okay, so these are the three questions we we answered offline. Now for the last question to get our discussion really started. Uh, this is it. I'm going to ask this one online. Uh, it's this. All right. Let's talk about this. The fourth question is this. Everyone has guilty pleasures. What if we made them central to our lives instead of hiding them away? It's hard to imagine, but what would change? Would our world be a better place or a worse one? Hmm. Wow, well, I'm going to go with my gut reaction. I'm sorry, yeah. but... Uh... I feel like my life would be significantly lessened by making mm. these central to my life. Um, I feel like they don't contribute to my 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 understanding in any way of anything, and I feel like it would just be me twiddling my thumbs until I died. Um, if it, if by what you mean is making them central to my life, being that I just simply mainly do only these things, and that's yes. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like well, my gut big chunkier is, day. I my gut reaction is I would be literal. I would be very sad. I, I would be very sad that that would have happened. Yeah. To myself. yeah. Uh, well, I wrote. Yeah, I wrote that before. I I, I saw this. I I just thought I, maybe I might feel comfortable. I might be a little bit more comfortable. But I yeah, I feel like my life would be seriously impoverished. Like it would just feel like I I was leading a really empty life and I wouldn't get anything really out of it. Living from day to day, just kind of blanking out large chunks of my day. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of struggling as well because my you know my gut that feeling is the same as you, but uh, I can't. And dismiss the nagging concern. This is simply because this is how me and my current life is placing my value. Is perhaps in this new world where I'm, you know, sectioning up, knowing of course that me, and whether I'm, I spend the day, the day reading idle blogs or building a house. Uh, so when the sun goes, oh, nothing's going to remain. And even knowing, knowing this is that it's all going to amount to nothing in the end. And perhaps. The only reason why I would feel impoverished is is because I'm thinking from my own current perspective, where I don't put that much value you know, on these activities. But if this we were somehow in a parallel universe where you know reading idle blogs or playing puzzles, puzzles mm -hmm. and dragons was seen as a more respectable pastime. I, I like where you're going with this, but I want to just let's just for the sake of discussion now, because maybe we're gonna this will come up later. I think let's for the sake of discussion now say you play or you read these blogs for the same reason, for the same reason, in, for the same reason that you are now in this parallel universe where they're central to your life. The the reason is exactly the same. You you, you want to relax, space out. Okay, then yeah. Uh, then yes, I would feel greatly impoverished. I wonder why how are you even getting up? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, oh, good. Because uh, all right. So then let's do a little transitioning. Let's start transitioning back to Wolf a little bit. Uh, so we talked about. So we're comparing werewolves. 
<laughs> if if we were, that would be pretty cool. But maybe <laughs> maybe one of them, maybe one of them only writes on a full moon. I'm not sure. Uh, like so, we talked about guilty pleasures, which I guess are things you like but you think you shouldn't. Uh, so I don't know. Would you say? Would you agree with me on this? Then the the difference between a guilty pleasure and a pleasure is simply that you like it, but you have no feeling that you shouldn't be doing it, right? Like eating ice cream. It, it's just a pleasure, but it's not a guilty pleasure. For me, anyway, it's not a guilty pleasure. Okay. I don't really eat a lot of ice cream. It would be for me, but... Okay, so it would be for you. You, th- you kind of you feel you shouldn't be eating ice cream. Uh, I, I got a little bit more baggage I'm lugging around than you. <laughs> uh, so for you, you, you feel like you shouldn't. Yeah. But, like, just pleasures in general, I mean... This is a really straightforward point, but the only difference would be, like, just you don't feel you shouldn't be experiencing them. Yeah. Right? Okay. So then let's, let's, move, let's move further on. Uh, then what's the difference between a feeling pleasure and feeling fulfilled? Uh, when does a when, – when, when do you – when you do something and you feel a pleasure, like, I don't know. I don't know. You, you meet a movie star, like she says in the book, or you eat ice cream. Okay, you. I, I feel pleasure from eating ice cream, but I don't feel any fulfillment from eating ice cream. But some things I do, and I do feel fulfillment after I've done them. What What do you think? What's going on here? What's the change? <laughs> okay, this is going to be awfully tough, so I'm going to just go with my gut again. Um, mm. Um, I don't know. This might sound strangely either platonic or I could go strangely Nietzschean, either one. But, I mean, often in cases with fulfillment, I, I don't even have to connect it with pleasure at all. Often things that I feel fulfilled about don't give gave me at the time little to no pleasure when I was doing it. Sometimes it's very hard to do, right? But when it's done, when it's over and done with, right, you have a feeling of a, an, incense, an increased sense of, I don't know, understanding or or... I, I don't know, even something, maybe even as broad as a, an increased sense of your own powers or may, maybe you feel like you're a stronger, better person. Your life has become better as a result of this. Whereas mm-hmm. after a pleasure is done, um, your life is the same. Nothing fundamentally has changed about you um, as a person. Mm-hmm. So, so there's something core has changed, even though at the moment maybe it wasn't fun. Right. A kind of a growth. Yeah, there's a growth. There we go. That's a good way to put it. A kind of a growth that occurs. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I may be jumping ahead here again, and but what I think it, it is is kind of feels like you know when you're writing in the narrative of your life, I've you feel for, for fulfillment after you've completed a task that you see is moving that narrative a step forward. Mm-hmm. You know, eating ice cream does not m- move my my narrative a step forward. And actually, this is my kind of guilty pleasure mm. as well. You know, the fact that you're not doing anything that even remotely moves that narrative forward is what makes it a guilty pleasure. Mm. Okay. Uh, so you kind of you've you've advanced somehow. You've proceeded yeah. along somehow. Yeah. Whatever you're whatever you're taking to be the story of your life, you're you take a step for a step forward. Hmm. All right. I, I like or both of you are uh, you answered. Like, can I ask you this? Just, just to, to kind of continue the discussion here. And I'm talking about the feeling of fulfillment now. Ooh, just yeah. feeling fulfilled. Uh, feeling. Keep that in mind when I'm talking now. Um, w- would you think I was strange if, uh, for example, on the weekend, like this upcoming Saturday or something, I, I kind of put everything down. And you know, I I got up, I got up late. Uh, I had my favorite breakfast. Uh, I made sure to go and do the shopping I've always wanted to do for a long time. And uh, I just I, I I sat at Starbucks for a while. I took a really long coffee break. I really refreshed myself. Um, and for dinner, I had the, my favorite thing along with some beer. And uh, you know. At, at night, I spent the, the night just kind of, you know, catching up on my taped videos, all of which really are not good TV, mind you. But I, I've, been, I've been meaning to catch up on them for a while. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, like, every single one of these things, I would not consider very... 
monumental. Uh, I would consider them all kind of mm, not so moving me forward. However, I, I, when the day gets done, would you think I was strange if I said, yeah, it was a, kind of a fulfilling day. I really got, I did a lot of the things I wanted to do today. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I filled that checklist up today. Um, well, perhaps me, that's that's the key what you said there, things that I wanted to do. So even yeah. though they're small step, steps, you're still seeing this as part of, you know, these are events that you have, you want to clear on your life story. Mm -hmm. Comparing like puzzles, Puzzle Dota, Puzzle Dota, Puzzles and Dragons. Mm. And sometimes when you don't have like a goal, you know, I want to, you know, clear a thousand dungeons dungeons before or I die or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm interested. Yeah, I I, I agree. Yeah. There is there is even in my retelling of like very low level events, it seems like some progress is being made. Oh, what what if I just like went straight and I said, w would you would you say I could get a feeling of fulfillment? Just from doing things I love. I just really love doing X, Y, and Z, so I spent the day doing X, Y, and Z. Um, regardless of my... Uh, of, of an objective criterion. I, and by the way, I'm talking about a feeling of fulfillment. I'm not talking about... Uh, we're going to get to this. I hope, I hope we're... We're really edging close to the book here. Yeah. But I'm just talking about the feeling of fulfillment. I just I, do a bunch of stuff I really, really like to do. This, this is where I, I want to say no. Mm. I'm going to say you can't do that. Um, I, I don't think the feeling of fulfillment can be separated from the feeling of meaning. Well, well I don't know. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a dozen... This camp here, you you'd have to somehow frame it. That, you know, even if the day was, for example, you just eating ice cream. Mm. Be, sometimes you you feel you hate yourself at the end of the day. But let's say say for whatever reason you're just doing something that's pure play. Mm. Somehow, but you are able to frame this as this is me, you know, letting off all this steam that's going to let me go back back and work with renewed gusto still on Monday. Oh. You, if you framed it in a way like that, but that's mm. cheating. Yes, that is cheating. That's cheating. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in your camp, but, but uh, you know, there's not meaning in the actions themselves, but it, there's meaning in the framing of it. So yeah, I'm very close to your side there. So oh, I like this kind of. This is exactly wow, Jesse. This is kind of exactly where I, my, I wanted to push this. Do you think this person, like you said, Dustin, is kind of, in a way, cheating, or somebody who who said this? kind of his misunderstanding what the real context of it is. Let's say he didn't realize that there was, th this was only fulfillment parasitic on other things in their life, right? It was parasitic on the work week between the weekend. Mm. And that's why it felt fulfilling. But they, they weren't aware that the, the film fulfillment was coming into it because it was parasitic on other factors that they weren't aware of. I mean, I, I like that. I really like that. Like, you, you, there's some kind of extra context here that this person is missing when they, when they say this. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, don't you think, like, it's possible for someone to miss that, though, to, to kind of miss that exterior context and, and feel like what they're doing might be fulfilling without realizing that there, there's an external context that that's, that's actually it's parasitic on to make that feel fulfilling. I very much think so. Mm. Um, and I just want to just want to bring this in is is just like getting into this book is in like the fact that like it, it's possible to even make a mistake at this level to not realize what you're feeling fulfillment is even based on. If you think it's just that weekend day, it, it's something longer in a larger picture. Um, and I I, don't, I think Susan Wolf. Yeah. Well, in along here, along this zone, right? Well, yeah, you just kind of give you a very real example of that. Uh, you know, you sometimes, sometimes hear of a guy uh, who, you know, he broke up with his girlfriend, and then then he says, "Okay, I'm going to take my mind off this. So I'm going to do something, do something I love." Uh, and he goes, goes to you know play the sport that he had. Act that he had met his girlfriend and playing or whatever, some, they, he partakes in some pleasure that they had 
part, you know, jointly throughout their relationship. Uh, because he just thinks, okay, this is my pleasure. And he goes and he does so that he's like, okay, why is this not fun? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what it actually was that was making that a fulfilling experience. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah, you can be mistaken about what your fulfillment consists in. I like that, yeah. Mm. Um, mm, that's a good example. Yeah, um, so, uh, like, like just from this, I, let, maybe we should just get into, very generally, what it is Susan Wolf is proposing here in this in this book. Um, uh, anybody want to sum I could do that, too. Anybody want to just give a, a really quick... Just do the quick quick summary because there's only one part that we're that anyone or and us two are going to end up talking about anyway, which is yeah. the objective side of it. So yeah. So okay, we'll just do the really fast uh, mm -hmm. version then. Uh, Susan Wolf thinks that uh, a meaningful life is kind of composed of two parts, like two things that you hear people say quite a bit actually. Two uh, part one is the what she calls the fulfillment view, and uh, this is what people mean when they say things like find your passion figure out what turns you on and go for it do what you love uh, so in other words find something you really really like and you get involved in it and then you get this what we talked about this feeling of fulfillment it, it emerges in you uh, which she says are not pleasures she wants to distinguish these from ple from pleasures uh, so as, as you're doing these things you love, you're getting this feeling of fulfillment. But the feeling of fulfillment is not enough to qualify as a, a meaningful life. She, says, she wants to say, to have a meaningful life, you need to have this objective component, uh, which she calls the larger than oneself view, which is commonly expressed as you should contribute to something larger than yourself, which, again, people say quite a bit. I, um, and in this case, she's taking larger to mean a metaphor for something which is in value independent of and has its source outside of you. Uh, so it has to be like legitimately meaningful. So you could be involved, and in, this came up uh, like on the Bad Wizards podcast, but uh, like if you're heavily involved in a cult, uh, she, she kind of might want to want to exclude that. Um, you're just being deluded. You're not, you might have the feeling of fulfillment participating in this cult, but you're being deluded. Uh, and there, there's no, this objective side is lacking. Um, and then she combined these th combines these together to call, make what she calls the fitting fulfillment view, which means basically a meaning life, meaningful life is A, the subject finds fulfilling, and B, contributes or connects positively with something the value of which has its source outside of the subject. In other words, meaning arises from loving objects worthy of love and engaging with them in a positive way. At least that's what she says. And so, well, just kind of summing up in, up in, in a few less words, it's when what you find fulfilling also has objective value. Basically, yeah. yeah. That's it. Um, I, I don't know. If I, I shouldn't be doing this right now, jumping the gun, but... <clears throat> I mean, like, so everyone's going to be talking about <clears throat> the objective part. This is what, I mean, we're, we're kind of all raised in a society that believes already that you need the subjective aspect of that. Like, you need to do what you love, man. Got to do your passion. Oh, you need the subjective, love you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody, this seems, it's like almost un, not even controversial even. To, like, so no one is going to go ahead and attack this, right? This is, of course, right? Of course, you got to do what you love, man. Follow your passion. Um, everyone's going to be more upset over the fact that she's going to claim that some things are unworthy of love mm. or unworthy of your life. Um, mm. that things, the objects that are not worthy of, of this kind of, of passion. Mm. Yeah. Gonna, well, this is going to be the, the most interesting part of it. But, okay, so... Now, I actually really, really like this essay, and I don't know if I should be doing this anyway, but um, my if I was going to have one objection to um, her her book at all, or her, this first part of her book at all, it would simply be, um, in, in, a, in a strange way, it's possible to justify too much. I'm actually on the crazy side. Like People are worried that she's going to cut things off. I'm actually worried that it's going to justify too much. And also that I'm also kind of, maybe not worried that it's going to justify too much, but 
I, I don't think the kind of person she talks about exists. Like, mm. for example, the person that loves their goldfish so much mm. that their whole life is centered around feeding their goldfish. Mm. Um, I mean, and this, and actually, what I think actually feeds right back into her theory. But I, I think, like, like she says, when you understand that life has, well, like she says, three components: meaning, um, the self, a sense of self, and ethics. Right. Mm. I mean, but when when you actually put meaning into your life, when you realize that there's a meaning aspect to your life, you actually start to rethink the other parts. These these are not independent parts; they're part of the same shape of you. So. Um, I, I, that's why I don't think it's fully possible to have the goldfish person. Um, mm. Really. I, I don't think that that person can exist because that person is justifying this to themselves already. Right? Mm. I, I, I don't think that this crazy person... I mean, they could be wrong about it, but they're, they're somehow justifying it already. They just don't simply like get up and be like, I'm goldfish now. right? And goldfish and that's it. Right? They're telling themselves some kind of story. Mm. Right, right. Some kind of something is going on here, already. Right, there's some kind of story happening, don't you think? Yeah. Well, again, shut in for several years. There is during in high school, school mainly. When all I would do is I'd go to school and go home and play video games. And yeah, I very much I justify I this worthless, worthless. This pursuit, not that video games are worthless, just only playing video games is worthless. Let me clarify that. I don't want to. I don't want all of our gamers just jumping on me. If all you do is playing video games, it's worthless. Less. Less. Or without some type of critical or reflection the outside connection. But so I would say I would attempt to justify this by I would I was would almost I would honestly try to structure a narrative to my life and say okay you my Life is to be experienced through the experiencing stories or something like this is, is the idea I had up. I had going, mm-hmm. but and it was, the point still stands. I was attempting to justify my, my actions and put place them into a larger meaning. Mm. Right. I mean, like, so I mean, like, I don't know. It, that's why I like, I agree with her totally. I just, it, it, some of these examples are so weird because I know she's giving it just for example's sake, right? Mm. Like, like, oh, somebody that's obsessed with their goldfish or somebody that's doing something just crazy. And they don't, I mean, and then I think maybe she said that they don't realize, like we said before, why they're doing it, right? That mm. would be like, I, I would feel that person can exist, mm. right? Yeah. But not yeah. this person that just has just this pleasurable obsession with X, right? I don't know. I don't real. I don't. Know if, I don't know if that person can exist. Right? They might be wrong about why they're obsessed with X. That's fine. Mm. I don't I mean. The, that's that's the only thing that I kind of felt a little bit weird about. Mm. Uh, yeah, I I I I, I kind of I understand where you're, you're going with this. I, I kind of I too feel like uh, when you're engaged with these objects, you are you're kind of telling yourself a story. Although I do think, um, just from the state of things, from from the fact that people seem to uh, misdescribe what they're doing, like I, I could see someone almost describing themselves that way. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like I just get, I just get pleasure from it. I just get pleasure from the goldfish. That's all. It's just an egoistic pursuit, and that's fine. That's what mm. I don't believe. The, yeah. I don't believe their I don't believe their self description of what's happening. To yeah, them. maybe they're making a, a mistake. Yeah, mm. about themselves, mm. which they might sincerely believe. So I mean, like, so no, no, leave staying in this area, right? So then, like, mm. then the question becomes, what can you say is not a meaningful life? Now, um, that I mean, like, so then we have to think about what what does the meaningful life have in common? Right. What? 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 What is? It's gonna sound like Socrates or something. What? It is. What is the meaningful life as opposed to the non-meaningful life? Right. I mean, she mentions the cult member or something. But mm. I mean, how, how about this? Um, you can think of something else. How about um, an alchemist? Um, an alchemist that spends their entire life trying to turn rocks into gold. That's it. They've mm. they spent their entire life convinced. That by studying alchemy, they can somehow be, perform magic. Wow. Um, meaningful life or not meaningful life? 
The, uh, but, is the thing we're going to get into meaningful from whose view? Well, uh, no, I, I mean from the perspective of that guy. Okay, from the perspective of that guy, I, and I'm assuming he somehow... That's two questions. Uh, from, First, he, from the perspective of him. Yeah, from this, from his perspective, if he's somehow assuming he's advancing some on some quest. Right, okay, uh, good. Okay, I failed, I didn't get it to gold, but my research will go on to the next... Okay, uh, good. So, uh, from his perspective, he thinks so. Now I want to ask from your perspective. My perspective? Yeah, meaningful. You do think so? Wow, I don't yeah, think well, so. Why wouldn't you? Oh, why? Oh, I can give you an answer. But first, I want to hear Justin, your answer. Meaningful um, or not a meaningful life? I'm going to have to cut the difference here. Um, I, I think... think no. I think he has a very slightly meaningful life. Very slightly. Very uh, slightly. In what sense does slightly. he have a meaningful life? From in, your in this, perspective. From, from yeah, from I mean, from an objective perspective, or, yeah. or, or from my perspective, or even yours, however you want to frame it. Uh, um, only in the sense that he. Uh, uh, so, in other words, I think it's. This is. I'm happy you're kind of jumping on this point because this is really important. It it deals. It has to deal with how he related to the object of his his yep. fulfillment. Exactly. And, um, if if he was relating to the object of his uh, his passion or the object of his fulfillment in this way, in the way of this, I want to forward the store of human knowledge. Um, then I think he had a he had a very slightly meaningful life in that he pursued the, the, the noble pursuit of, of advancing human knowledge. So, okay, yes, he was wrong. But I think there is value in that pursuit. Uh, but not as much as he thought. He was wrong about how important what he was doing was. Uh, but there, there is something there. Okay, see, I mean, like, then again, you could say the same thing about the cult member then, too. Right? I mean, I mean if you're going to go that far, if you're going to give that much... Right, but I mean, like, I, I think it was important, and well, I'll tell you why I say no, is because, mm. um, because he was, I mean, he was wrong about his connection to reality. Uh, he, he was wrong was, about his relation. He was wrong about the relation. So, in other words, it, it's wrong. He, if he knew what we know, mm. he would feel his life was meaningless. So uh. he he was he was in error as to his relation to reality. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he thought by studying alchemy that he was getting in touch with the truth. Mm. But we know mm. that he was not. Uh, we know that. All right. So when, uh. from his, from if, if he could somehow learn what I know now, he would have said that was a waste of time. Uh, okay, can I give you... All right, I want to give you... Because I, I was actually right here. I'm right here with you. I, I This point concerned me a little bit. Let me, let me give you a, a difficult... Example the other way and see if what your in intuition is then. So l let's take not this alchemist. Let's take somebody like Bertrand Russell. Uh, so Bertrand Russell had a huge project. I mean, okay, so Bertrand Russell was a legendary philosopher and he published lots of books. Okay, let's put that all on the side. Bertrand Russell had his logicist, logicist project. He was trying to make math into logic and it failed. Uh, however, um, like the principal Mathematica, all this stuff, this, this this immense effort with like Whitehead and these guys to to change math into logic. I think don't don't aren't you pulled in the direction that this was meaningful despite its failure? I mean, he was wrong. Okay, like thank you, thanks Hegel. <laughs> um, right, all oh, good. Bertrand Russell was a determined negation. Okay, yeah, from the perspective of history, yeah, or God. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, again, like if I were Hegel and I were sitting back looking at world history and saying, well, isn't everything just a determinate negation to the future, mm. right? Everything leads towards the truth. Um, yeah, <laughs> from that grandiose perspective of mm. world history and everything is led to me, Hegel, right? The end of history. Well, from that perspective, yes, everything does have a meaning. Um, but I want to ask you, if, if somehow it was proven it was proven that you cannot, I don't know, mathematically re or logically reduce mathematics. I don't know what this would be. I don't know how you would do it. But, I mean, what would Bertrand Russell think about his time he spent on the Principica Mathematica? Um, I mean, what would he think from his perspective? I mean, from our perspective, oh, look, yeah, thanks to him, 
we have now advanced the, the, the study of truth, and he's inspired other people, so therefore... You mean um, we're losing the subjective side of it, not the objective side? Yeah. Uh... I mean, like, what are we going to do? I mean, yeah, from now, now looking from our outside, like, oh, okay, well, even though you didn't intend it, Bertrand Russell, you've now advanced philosophy and science to a certain degree by by failing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're suggesting is, well, yeah. the failure has led, led science forward. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense from our perspective, from an outside perspective, but what do you think he would think about that? I think he'd be insanely disappointed. Would he think that he would feel like his task was meaningful. I mean, if, if you did tell him, look, your failure will now inspire millions to go on to the correct knowledge, maybe. But what if it didn't? Uh, uh, I mean, like, I, you're, you're suggesting that all of this has, like, I mean, like, you're, you're building these connections up as if, like, like Hegel. Like, it's some kind of grand necessity that, well, his failure now led to Wittgenstein and the study of computers and, and, and logic. But, you know, it could have very well happened without Bertrand Russell. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely want to give you that. What do you think about this, though? Like, um, how should I say, like, so Bertrand Russell, I, I'm, I'm, oh, wow, I'm going to cheat again, so watch out. I'm cheating again. Uh, Bertrand Russell was engaged in a valuable pursuit, which was the advancement of human knowledge in philosophy. Yeah, I think um, if, if he and he thought that too. Yeah. Right. He was using philosophy to try to find the truth, and if that's all he was after, if that's it, then okay, I give him that. Okay, you're down, yeah. even if you're wrong. Um, we we know that by thinking through problems, we can advance truth, even if you're wrong. Yeah. Okay. If that's if that was the only goal he had in mind, then you win this this argument. Mm. I mean, that's not the only goal, but see, that would be the thing. Like, I I think just it would drop in meaning. It would the meaningfulness would that level of meaningfulness. Like, but I'm what I'm saying is like, um, his, his the level of meaningfulness of his life would be much more than uh, if I was sitting here telling myself that Puzzles and Dragons was somehow if I got it into my head that play, playing Puzzles and Dragons was somehow advancing the, the store of, of, of electrical impulses that was propelling the internet forward which is so diluted, right? That would be so diluted that somehow by playing Puzzles and Dragons I'm actually doing anything of meaning. Um, that I would just have to dilute my delude myself, delude myself over and over again to get to anything. Whereas Bertrand Russell, what Bertrand Russell was engaged in, I mean, he was engaged in a public discourse on on the nature of reality, a public a public meaningful discourse on truth. I, I think he he would have me beat at the very least if I sat here telling myself like, oh, puzzles and dragons is you know keeping me sane so I can go to work again tomorrow and you know get through another day, right? Something like that. And my work is slowly contributing to the advance of society. I, I think he'd still have me beat. Well, I don't know. It does feel like you're cheating because Bertrand Russell obviously had in mind that even if he knew he failed, he had at least engaged in a project of inquiry mm. that was worthy. So let me turn the tables again. Okay. In the Middle Ages, they used to have arguments about how many angels could dance on a pinhead. Mm. Meaningful debates, I tell you. <laughs> okay, so let's pretend we spent several years debating on how many angels were dancing on pinheads. Mm. Now please tell me that that was meaningful. Within the social system, it might have been. Uh, but that, but we what you're don't doing, think it so. doesn't. So you, 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 uh, you've been accusing Justin of cheating, being on the fact that you've already stacked the deck against you. Well, the, yeah, he has to be able to do this in order. Yeah, to, exactly. I mean, this I mean, is—he I mean, he cheated by by giving by by mm. giving Bertrand Russell an out. Mm. Mm. By, by somehow telling a story that by mm. in the long run, look mm. what happened. Mm -hmm. all, all this knowledge advanced. Well, I can say the same thing about a cult member. Well, okay, so this person joined a cult, and they died deluded. But in the long run, their children saw that. They were angry, and they grew up to be an anti-cult group, uh, and they saved the world. I don't know if I'd include the children in there, because the, they... They had absolutely no relation to their children, but like... The well, how did Bertrand Russell have a relation to Wittgenstein's work later? Uh, well, I mean, aside from I the mean, fact that they work together, I mean, like, aside from that, you mean like the aside from that. Pr Principia Mathematica... Let, let's imagine, like, his life only existed in the Principia yeah. Mathematica. Only, right? And he did nothing yeah. else. Nothing. Um, um, you're right. I, I think, like, then... Um, 
I think like it starts going down and down and down, like this angel's dancing on the head of a pin thing. I mean, it's getting really tiny at this point. I really think it's it's the meaning is yeah pretty darn small, so almost can, to the level of trivial. I mean, so do you understand why I said this this justifies too much? I mean, well, exactly. I can play this game too. Yeah, I can play this game, right? Well, in the long run, in the Hegelian view of history, everything mm. becomes a determinate negation. I mean, that's why I like Hegel, because there are no mistakes in Hegel. Everything mm. is a success, because everything is on the path to truth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love that part of it. Actually, you know, that's one of my favorite things about Hegel, in a crazy way. So, I mean, I'm almost arguing against myself in a little bit, because mm. this is a view that attracts me so much that I have to pull back a little bit. But... You know, I, 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 the one thing that Hegel has often been accused of is ignoring the subjective side of history, right? Mm -hmm. How it feels to be that determinate negation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know. I mean, are we allowed to ignore the subjective side of meaning? I mean, if I told that cult member the truth or mm -hmm. if I told that, 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 that medieval philosopher the truth or the alchemist the truth, would mm -hmm. they have the same opinion of their life? You know, in a weird way, like, I, it's kind of interesting. Like, as I was doing this, I almost had the opposite problem of a lot of people. I almost had problems. I was almost, like, routing the whole thing into objective truth. You know what I mean? Like, objective meaning. I Sometimes I had trouble remembering the subjective side of things as, as opposed to most people. And I, I kind of, I do think you really put your finger on something that got to me as I was reading the essay. I was opposite. Um, you're right. I, I think that the man himself would have been seriously disappointed. Oh. Would, would he have considered his task meaningful? If he knew it was wrong. You mean, you mean like almost like he, he, he was, he's like driving a car and it's heading for a brick wall and he knows it. Yeah. He knows the car is heading for a brick wall yeah. kind of thing. So basically I mean, what you're describing is if somehow uh, we told well, – let's go back to your alchemist because it's a little bit of a simpler example. Well, we told the alchemist, okay – Mm -hmm. uh, your alchemy studies mean absolutely nothing. Alchemy doesn't exi exist, but you still have to continue your studying alchemy for the rest of your life. Yeah, imagine uh, that, right? And I mean that that seems seems absurd. I cannot imagine, and that's why I said that you know you were kind of, it seemed like you were cheating from day one, even before the, uh, Justin hopped in, is because as uh, that could not be possible. So, well, I mean no. If you told the, the alchemist this, there's you know, kind of showed him how whatever you would have to do to convince it, and you invoked God or something, and then said, okay, now continue you pursuing alchemy. Do you find your life meaningful? Or well, he would not continue to pursue pursue alchemy under that case. The only reason why he was able to find his life meaningful well, was because he didn't have that knowledge. He didn't exist in a system where that knowledge uh, did not exist. So my, exactly, my, my suggestion is that meaningfulness in this sense is a connection with reality. Mm. I think mm. a, a, re, a meaningful life is a lucid life, like Camus suggested, and it's a, it's a life that's connected, it, it's knowledge connected to life, and it's, it's actually, it has to somehow even be connected to the good in a certain way, I think, in, at least in common usage of meaningful, unless we want to go about saying, like, Hitler was, I had a really meaningful life, too. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I mean, like, don't you think, like, for example, now I'm going to take this even more extreme. Like, oh, Jesse, by the way, you're living in, you're living in the uh, Matrix. Everything you've ever done doesn't matter. Well, you didn't do it. Cool. Well, uh, yes, that uh, then I would fe feel meaningless as in that context. But uh, and I would then realign my my life towards something else. But if I were to li be born and die in the matrix, yeah, but you can be wrong about that. Yeah, That's I can what I'm trying to say is you can be wrong about the meaning of your life. Mm. Mm. And, and you would fully accept that you were wrong if you had that correct knowledge. Mm. Right, again, you, if, you bore, if you were born and died in the Matrix and you saw the woman in the red dress a hundred times, who wouldn't want to look at the woman in the red dress? Um, you, you, would, you would you'd go right to your grave thinking your life was meaningful. But I'm saying, if you had that knowledge, if you knew that you were in the Matrix and nothing you did was meaningful, um, you, would, you would throw up your hands. And that is a way you can be wrong about mm. your meaningful life. If, mm. if, they, if, if, if this isn't what it means to be wrong about meaning... 
please tell me what is what does it mean to be wrong about meaning? Oh. Um, my question would be, be what, how could that ch change my you know if we were looking thing back on my life you know I've lived and died in the matrix and then historians you, you know even like they after where we defeated the machines and the matrix have been gone for whatever the reason we're looking back on the life lives of of people in the major drakes. I don't think they could that these historians looking back at my life that had meaning within that system could honestly say that I was wrong about that that meaning within that closed system. So they couldn't could not say that my life was objectively without meaning. Well, I mean, again, right? You're, you're again, you're taking this kind of long historical view, and you're like, well, you didn't feel like your life didn't have meaning. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't dispute that. You felt mm. like your life was meaningful, and you thought it was meaningful. But so does the cult member, right? Mm. I mean, but the problem is, like, what I'm trying to say is, not someone from the outside. This is not what I'm saying. We're looking back upon history mm. and, and looking back at like these old people saying, "You fools! Ha ha ha! Look at how smart we are." I'm saying they themselves would well, feel their lives were meaningless had they had the knowledge that we have today. So basically, you're you're saying that this is like somebody told me on my deathbed, and or any well, anytime, anytime. Well, okay. Hey, well, it could only. Really happen on my death because if not, I would be able to reorient. I would think, think you know, if you told the alchemist in his twenties, yeah. is that alchemy was was nothing. He would have done something different. And, but if somehow you know whatever, where I'm dead and then the angel, Joel's, they pick me up and say, by the way, hey, you know, I'm this, I'm the alchemist now. Well, by the way, <laughs> your life your life was meaningless because al you know alchemy really doesn't exist. That's just a fairy tale. Yes, yes, I would feel. It. Uh, it was meaningless. That's only because my, you know, my story that got interrupted. My s story I was writing just ended up getting um, interrupted. But, uh, but so long as that story uh, is not interrupted by some, you know, it have to be almost act of goddess here. here it'd be difficult. Oh, I mean, um, again, you're saying that you wouldn't feel that way. Well, yeah, I agree with you. But it doesn't matter. You can be wrong about that. I mean, in that case, you were wrong about what you were doing. You, uh, you were wrong about... So, okay, l let's at least put it like this. You were wrong about what gave your life meaning. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah. from a long historical perspective, your alchemy didn't amount to a hill of beans. Uh, what your alchemy did was it advanced the science of chemistry. <clears throat> so, and, you know, if... if again, like, I, and I always, when I read Hegel, it always kind of makes me laugh. Like, what do you say to the people in the past who are determinate negations for the futures. Well, thank you for your failures. Right? Um, and again, if you can take that long historical perspective and say like, well, even if I fail, at least I've advanced the truth. Like, like you did, Justin. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. If, if, if that's what you're up to. Mm. If that's what you're up to. Mm. But I mean, like, if from that long perspective, this is why I said in the beginning, you can justify almost anything. Mm. I, it's interesting, like, when you say almost anything, I suppose even among that, there, there's probably levels. Right, you're right about uh, levels. You agree, you um, have me there, right? Um, but, like, what do you think about this, then? Like, I'm sure, though, the, the, is, is the criterion of meaning success. Mm. Um, that's why, uh, I mean... I mean, it, the, the, for the person themselves, though, you're right. On the subjective side, I think a lot of people would locate their some of their like in their job or something, or or in their studies or something. Their criterion of meaning being uh, success. But you know, I don't know. What would you think like uh, about some some guy who cooked up something that just kind of failed, but it was a really interesting attempt? Uh, uh, then I, I mean, like, if it's a failure, but it's the, the method is sound and it's connected to reality, mm. okay, fine, I, I'm, I'm down with that. But if, for example, but if, if someone were next to me and he said to me, Dustin, I am eating popcorn, and I'd say, why are you eating popcorn? He said, well, I'm eating popcorn to better understand women. I'd say, you're a fool. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, he would just be totally wrong. 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 Yeah, yeah. He just no matter how much popcorn wrong. he ate, he would be wrong. And it doesn't matter that after he died, we learned that popcorn had nothing to do with women. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. He he would just. <sighs> and, and if, if, if being mistaken about meaning means anything, what else could it mean? Uh, that's my question too. Find if you don't like my my ideas about like how you can mm. make it all meaning. What does it mean to be mistaken about the meaning then, in an objective sense, for you? Hmm. Um. This is something I really tried to think about. I mean, I guess the first question that occurred to me was was this, right? Do you have to be correct about what your life means for yourself to have a meaningful life? Do, do you need do those two need to match? I That's yeah, a good I thought about this too, and I would say you know let's let's go back to to Camus here. Let's go to Don Juan because this whole uh, well, I kept flashing back to Don Juan throughout this the, this entire first part of this essay, say, mm. and it seemed like one of this premise is of this objective of meaning she's trying to push here. You know, the meaning that you're not actually wrong about your meaning is that at the end of your life you look back and say, say okay, who, you know, I did something meaningful. You know, people have, this is what, you know, people, um, when Camus talked about Don Juan, um, he said, you know, people were going to look at Don Juan when he was old and, you know, he was too old to get any. And he finally, Don Juan's not, ha not having sex. He would look back in his life and say, "Oh God, uh, my life! I, you know, I, I fucked all these women, but my life amounted to absolutely nothing. Now I'm just an old old guy who's gonna die alone." Um, and it seems like you know this is says why he needed to have some kind of objective value pursuit, so that when he looks back and was un unable, you know, whatever this pursuit was, maybe, you know, let's say it was building houses. Says, you know, he's now too old to build houses. So he's like, okay. Who? Who? I'm I'm too old to do anything. I'm just like like stupid Don Juan over there. Yeah, but at least something remained. And now this seemed to be what this this thing of objective meaning was. Maybe it was just the fact that she talked about syphilis. Sisyphus. Yes. Freudian slip there. There. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she talked about Sisyphus as as in like direct connection to the subjective meaning. Okay, so maybe this is what where I got these two ideas mashed together, but... I mean, uh, like, again, like, I, how about we attack it from the different direction, which is what I thought about, too. I mean, like, for example, the alchemist, I think he, he can... You can be mistaken in two ways. You can, you can think something is meaningful, but it's not. But you can also think something is not meaningful, and it be meaningful, really. This is, and this yeah. is what you're, you're, you're using this trick on me to say, like, well, he was doing all these things that he didn't think were meaningful, but actually were. And from yeah. the objective standpoint, that's true. But sadly enough, that's not true from the subjective standpoint. So exactly, this is kind of where I tripped up. And wow, you're right. This is exactly kind of where I took it as someone who was almost falling into the objective standpoint more than I thought I would. Like, I just imagined, like, what if there was just some guy who wanted to make a couple of bucks out of total egoism. He just wanted to buy some booze or something. And just to make a couple of bucks in his tool shed, he came up with a tool that uh, revolutionized the world. He had cured cancer. But, like, he had no interest in that, right? He just wanted a couple dollars so he could, you know, buy some more alcohol so he could drink his, his sorrows away. Um, are we going to describe that guy's life as meaningful as the man who ended cancer? Uh, well, like, he doesn't have the correct relationship to the object to, to, to have the meaningful life, I think. You're right. Um... The, the action itself has a meaning. The action itself has a great meaning. It has a world-changing meaning. But his life, yeah, I would not describe as meaningful. As a meaningful life. Um, as opposed to the action being a meaningful action. Despite, like, his mistake about what it means. Right? So the things he does, yeah, could have large meanings that he... that don't really give his life meaning, though. I mean, and, and this is... Like, okay, so this is, I don't know, I'm just guessing about the next half of this essay, but isn't this what makes this so important? What we're doing here is so important. What makes philosophy 
And if you want to call it criticism, so be it. Um, philosophy so important is it lets you think about your connection to what's going on because mm -hmm. you can be fundamentally wrong about what's going on. That's why the critic needs to pull you back. Like, for example, you could be wrong about what you're doing with Puzzles and Dragons or you, it could take the wrong role in your life. It, it could, it, it, you could somehow get the idea that it's not just a time to blow off steam, that it's a time to learn about, I don't know, dragons. Um, that's when you need to take a step back and philosophy can help you do that as to to put your passions in the correct place in your life thus putting the ship of state or in this case the ship of the soul in the right order a philosophy will help you put that objectively in the right place it needs to be mm. that's why or, it's important or give you a better shot at it anyway yeah, um, yeah I, I, I like that yeah um, as I, instill, I really see how the subjective value can crumble. Well, well, due to anything we talked about now, it just seems hard to deny the, the you know, let's take the alchemist as, as I keep getting caught up on the, this. You know, let's take him out of history. He, did, you know, he did his pursuit. It doesn't matter what it that it agreed, what it it aggregated to. Uh, in, over the course of history, the fact that he he devoted in it, his entire life to a project makes it seem objectively meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he, you know, like I said, if we could go and tell him on his deathbed, bed, you know, the, the truth, and he would would wail and scream and curse. There's there's all the years wasted on his deathbed, bed, and we could would feel great because we were other jerks. <laughs> but I mean, like you could, like, how, couldn't we yeah, also comfort him? We, we, yeah. we, we could comfort him at the same time, right? Like, like when I when I talked about the suicidal man too, right? I mean, like we we could comfort this alchemist and say, well, okay, so you were fundamentally wrong about your life's project. Mm. But don't worry, you weren't. It's possible. It's possible to be wrong about your life and the role your life played in history. But you did play a role in history. Your, your life was meaningful, but it wasn't meaningful for the way you thought, which is why life is such a tricky thing and, mm -hmm. and, and why you can be fundamentally wrong about the life you're living or how you're seen or your role in history or the value of you, right? Yeah, oh, yeah that's yeah, like I said, this is how I, how I re think we can, can, you know, we, well, we can mess with or we can restore where the subjective yeah. Yeah, but it, it seems much harder to to fuzzle because remember you originally we were trying to say you know would his life have objective value and I'm having trouble seeing how it could not. Right, and I mean with, like, all, with but, this God's eye view, you you can justify anything, but the problem is that there's a subjective element here. Yeah, I mean yeah, the subjective element. And I'm completely on your page of all you know how we can destroy or redeem it and through all through different ways of knowledge and thinking. And that's, again, why my philosophy is so important. Mm. But, well, what, what, do you, what would you think about this? Like, if, if I told this alchemist, what, what, if, what if I said to him... Because, I mean, it just seems like like what he was trying to do would have been something that changed history forever. It would, it would be like a spike in history. In other words, it would it'd just be something never seen before. It, its effects would have just change the world forever. It's just like a Mount Everest, if you will. But like, what if I just went to him and I said, um, yeah, uh, that was all meaningless. But you know what wasn't meaningless? It was the fact that, you know, you were a good person. Mm. Um, you had a good character. You were virtuous. Uh, you, you didn't, you know, you helped people when they needed it. Uh, do you think maybe, you know, it's possible he could... Be yeah, satisfied with I, that. I, yeah. I mean, it's possible, but we're, again, we have to think about the kind of guy he is, right? I mean, how much did he put into this? Which is why, like, we talked about this a little bit with with Hume and, and suicide. Mm -hmm. But I mean, meaning is a gamble that can kill you, right? Yeah. He rolled the dice, and who knows how much he put into those dice when he rolled it? And I don't know. Can can I can I talk him out of his sorrows by saying he was a nice guy? I would like to think I could, mm -hmm. but. I, w I also have to believe that when he changes his consciousness to better be in touch with the truth, like Hegel said, the path of history is the path of despair. 
Mm. Right? When, when one era realizes that its entire relation to the world or the, the truth is wrong, Mm. It, it, it walks down the road of despair. It crumbles. The whole field crumbles. I mean, and this is not some kind of abstract, like, whoops, I was wrong about that math problem. This is a despair from the soul. Mm. C- can I ask you a cra- crazy question? L- like, what we're doing here, like you and Jesse, like, what, what if what if I did, what if I did descend from the heavens right now? I don't know, you were going to die tomorrow. Like, we're on our deathbeds. And I descended from the heavens. I'm like the angel of death, I guess, now. Uh, so Jesse's an alchemist. I'm the de- angel of death. Um, and, and I said, yeah, um, so all those ideas, all those philosophical ideas you had, sorry, all wrong. Every single one. I don't know. Like, okay, yeah, I would be like, whoa, aporia. Uh, but uh, Socrates is here. Uh but, but but isn't that the isn't that the wonderful thing about philosophy is like we it, at least philosophy allows you to take that step back, right? And mm. to be like, well, I'm willing to be wrong about everything. I'm willing to accept the idea that I am wrong about everything. Mm. I mean, that's part of the game we're playing with philosophy is like mm. we're we're here to we're to question our fundamental beliefs, right? It's, it's we're here to kick our, kick ourselves out of being stuck in the world, mm. right? I mean, that's part of the game and. And if you're saying, well, that that was meaningful, then we already know that. We yeah. already know that. Yeah, you yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. have to tell us that. We we know that already, right? Mm. Did the alchemist? You're. Know? Right. I mean, I think a lot of people kind of are in a wrong relation in this in the sense that if they demand this success, right, rather than, uh, you know, like what well, kind of what I, the way I would take it is be like, well, you know, I I would still consider some of what I did meaningful, just in in the the mere pursuit. Yeah, in the pursuit without, with without any legitimate success, just the mere pursuit was I, meaningful I, to I, me. I think so, that's great, and that would be almost a Camus-like vision, wouldn't it? Yeah. Now, here's, a, here's the question. Maybe we can just kind of frame the spirit what you said, to Justin, but just kind of frame it. Imagine you're playing, playing a video game, some epic RPG. You put a hundred hours into to it, and you're approaching the end. This is something that ends. It's not, it's not like World of Warcraft or anything. There's a clear end, and you're approaching the end, and then your PS3 dies. As mm-hmm. all the time, the hundred hours you've spent playing that game is that now meaningless? I Even don't think. I, I, can I? Sorry. Continue. Yeah, go go for it. Oh, okay. I, I think like for example, it depends on. Again, your relation to the object of your desire or your, mm. your, your project. So, example, like a song. A song can be taught about the same way, right? Oh, the song ended before it got finished. Does that mean the song I listened to this point was meaningless? No. I loved mm. the song up until this point. And every song has to end, but, you know, every song, a song wouldn't be a song without an end. But every moment is valuable in itself. And just like if you're playing that game and enjoying it as that game in itself, as the, the playing of the game and not obsessed with the success of the game, Mm-hmm. Um, like then, I think yeah, you, you're you're right on the right track. But if if you are that crazy guy that's got to get his PlayStation accomplishments, and you're like gonna break the disc in half if you don't get that platinum trophy, well, tough luck for you. You've put you or you're you're in the wrong relation to that object, or at least it didn't work out for you there, did it? Mm-hmm. Um, so again, you need to be in the right relation to that object that you're doing. It, can't philosophy help you do that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Something feels almost like that's a way that the Stoics almost went to, where they just kind of uh, put themselves in a particular relation to reality in in, in virtue, where I mean the, they didn't really care about anything beyond mm. just being this virtuous guy. Yeah, yeah. Epictetus would would have said, uh, "Yeah, you know, I enjoyed uh, every every level, every hour of grinding thing, and you don't." Um, God, ooh, God, I'm trying to, I'm trying to rephrase his his arrow, arrow parable into video game terms, but it's not coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Mario jumps not to the edge of the, to the uh, end of the, end of the gap. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Oh. All right, like, all right. So Dustin, you brought in Camus. Let's bring Camus back a little okay. bit. Okay. Um, 
So in our Camus video, we talked about the le- in the third video we talked about peanut butter. So let's mm. bring the peanut butter back now. I think we're ready to talk about it again. Um, so it, with the context of the discussion was something along these lines. Um, so comparing this is such an absurd comparison, but uh, why is Shakespeare? Oh, I'll say, well, let's compare Shakespeare and a man eating peanut butter with the peanut butter on the bottom side of the bread. Um, is one more valuable than another one? Is one more meaningful than another one? And uh, we, in that discussion, we were talking about how, how Camus seemed to think like the, one of the sources of meaning was the fact that like there is always this this little bit of extra, this little bit of more. That, that nothing could quite capture. In, in a sense, in a strange, if you put it in a strange way, the very meaninglessness of the world is what made it tolerable. The, the fact that uh, we can't capture the world in a meeting it was what made it good. Um, but, like, oh, he, he does have this thing, right, where he says, you know, he ends up having to put quantity over quality. It's just there's this more. There's always this more available, and because of this more, the revolt can happen. That's the, the key for the revolt, because you can become lucid and see that nothing is captured. Not, not everything is captured in this, that there's always something missing here, and observe reality. Um, so, okay. But... Now, I, let's talk about this. I mean, I guess the peanut butter guy, the, the, the guy eating peanut butter compared to Shakespeare, I mean, it just seems like there's just nothing objectively in the peanut butter, is there? There's uh, not enough at the very least. Yeah. I mean, I guess the thing is, like, you would have to take this really strange relation to the peanut butter, like yes. like Camus does, like this this kind of revolt against... But see, this revolt happens against all of life yeah. everything like ever this 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 lucidity is toward is cast at everything right not not just shakespeare it, everything right um and, and it just it just seems like i mean he's talking about just these astronomical big meanings the meaning does life have an ultimate meaning but w- within this frame within the framework of life it seems like something like Shakespeare would have more of a value simply because there's more meaningful things to take out of it than the peanut butter. Um, more objectively meaningful things to take out of it than yeah, the peanut or butter. At the very least, it would be, I don't know, much easier to remain lucid and see lucidity within by observing Shakespeare and reading Shakespeare than it would to see the different variations of peanut butter that you're eating every time. I mean, yeah. it's, it's going to help him remain lucid, and that was his main project, right? To remain lucid and active in the face of an uncaring universe. Mm. And I, I still agree with him. Ultimately, there's, there is no meaning built into the universe. Mm. So we can't talk in that, that way. Um, in the grand does, way, in right, the grand yeah. way, meaning doesn't exist in the universe somehow, like object, like really objectively in the universe, right? Which we have to take a soft me- a soft meaning of meaning. Um, and so, in, in that sense, like in a soft objective sense, yes, the Shakespeare has got to be because for me, the source life is the thing in itself. Your projects, your life, your relation to life, your relation to the real, right? Your relation to what you're doing. It, it is is going to be the source of all value. It, it can only be the source of all value, and it doesn't seem like peanut butter. Or how about this? We'll use your levels idea. Mm-hmm. Peanut butter would be much di- more difficult. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to remain lucid in. Yeah, I mean, in in a strange way, it almost seems like. What do you think? Like the, the peanut butter almost boils down to what we started with, like a guilty pleasure, or just even something close to a pleasure. Yeah. I, I don't see... I mean, I always almost see, like, you look at the peanut butter guy just to take a break. Like, oh, yeah, uh, I finally got out of things. I, I'm relaxing now. I'm watching the guy eating the peanut butter. Uh, you know, I'm finally outside of all these, like, this oppressive daily life I lead. I'm going to just lucidly observe this guy eat peanut butter. And look, you know, I really missed how the peanut butter got on his cheek or something, right? You know what I mean? 
Um, I mean, or if your life project is like Camus, one of only constant revolt, and yeah. this is your statement of revolt against the universe, it could very well be meaningful. It, it yeah. could help your project advance if you understood your relation to the peanut butter like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But true, it's true. very dependent on your relationship to the peanut butter. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. It's very gonna true. Your, it's going to hang on your projects that you consider meaningful. Yeah, but so, I mean, yeah. that, that's going to be a thing. Is you don't get to determine what is meaningful a lot. <coughs> Just like authenticity, like you're not born into the world blank. You come yeah. in with a set of values and a set of ideas that are determined by a social system. Mm. Um, so you're also in constant contact with that system. So you you don't get to really just say, well, uh, my life is meaningful because I have a black shirt. Or yeah, because I chose to wear. Something that chose to wear a black shirt, right? That just it, it doesn't happen. And it, the worst, thing, but the thing about it is, you can't do it. You can't do it for yourself. Like if I were to just, I can't lie to myself and say, "Well, I got a black shirt, so that's it. It's all over." I, I, the destruction of the self is not like that. Your destruction of the self is dialogical. Like mm. Charles Taylor said, I mean, there's something inherently dialogical about you that you're always you're, you're already in contact mm. with whatever it may be, the group or the others or reason itself, right? Yeah, I mean, that's why I thought it was interesting where she talked about like maybe sometimes getting feedback even if you're not asking the question, you mm. may be getting feedback on these kind of unconscious levels about the meaningfulness of your activity. But mm. I, I want to say like I do think there are a lot of people too who though they don't take that extra step. They just say, well, I like it, and they never bothered. You know, they might be getting this kind of feedback at a certain level, but I don't think they really bring it lucidly to consciousness either. <laughs> right, which is why like, you have to because it could, assume, it could take over a wrong position in your life, right? Yeah. And then, again, you could end up like the alchemist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, yeah, and on top of that, I mean, I'm, we're going to get into this more, but I'm sure be, being lucid of it makes it even better sometimes. Yeah. Right. Um, it can make it even stronger or even more meaningful uh, depending on how lucidly you engage what you're doing. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Do I have anything else I want to talk about here? Um, I, can I just talk about one thing that I was sure. thinking about? And this is going to be just a side topic quickly. Mm. But um, a lot of, I, again, I, I know that a lot of people don't like the objective side of this. But I, I don't know. I kind of thought, like, because people are like, uh, I was like, okay, why don't, peop- why, don't, why don't people like the objective side of this requirement that life have meaning? And then my, my, my only thought was that, you know, the, 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 the fear is that there's going to be, I don't know, some bully... Or some arrogant guy that's going to come in and say, well, I know what's objectively meaningful in your life is not, right? Some guy that has this air that they know the Mm. schema of all life, that they've somehow systematized life and they know what life is fully. And they're going to say, just say to you, your life project is meaningless, right? I mean, that's the fear, right? Mm. But I don't know, for me, for me... um, uh, again, like I don't accept that man. I, I like Camus or the existentialists. That say life always absca- escapes that. Like life yeah. is always escaping your your grasp that meaning. But I think uh, objectivity is necessary for the subjective individual, right? You need it more yeah. than anyone else, right? It's it's not. So my fear is that of not having it, right? Mm. It's necessary from the perspective of the individual. I mean, yeah. it's, it, it'd be like it'd be like getting up every morning and saying, "I am so smart." I am so smart, um, and never hearing it again, right? Mm. It's just looking at yourself and telling yourself you're smart again and again and again, or you're handsome again and again and again. It's it's so hard to do, right? Which is why you need that, I don't know, perspective from nowhere or whatever you're going to call it, the yeah. quote-unquote objective perspective. is it, You can't maintain these opinions without whatever it may be. And although Susan Wolf is is very hesitant about associating that with the crowd, and I totally understand why, because again, this is going to come back to the Stoics, right? I mean, like they used God's divine mission to pull people out of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like the danger of Susan Wolf here is, and she knows this fully, is that well, the objective meaning is going to be what the crowd determines is meaningful. So whatever your society says is meaningful, sorry, got to obey. But she doesn't want that. 
Yeah. Um, so in her case, what's going to what's going to take the place of God is going to have to be reason. Reason mm. is what's going to pull you out of the crowd. So the yeah. the the supposed I don't know rational something that mm. exists, even if it even if it doesn't exist, right? Really, mm. right? Um, um, this is what's going to help you pull away from basically subservience to the crowd. Yeah. Um, um, some thoughts I had reading. Yeah, I agree, and I mean, although I think reason's going to lead 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 that uh, the power of imagination too. It sounds strange to say, like, <laughs> imagination. <laughs> wow, but, South Park. <laughs> but, like, uh, the, the, the role of the... I'm talking about, I'm talking about Mont Montage here. Uh, uh, he, he, the, the power of the imagination is going to have to be included in this, too, to kind of come up with and create. And also, um, a kind of a more... Uh, well, an ethical sense or moral sense would also... Uh, uh, do this too, like somehow being able to dig through a lot of these moral sources that support you, with your reason, of course, and, and, and trying to come up with you know, new, different readings that are not appreciated in your time. But all these together will lead you outside of some kind of doxa or crowd rule or something. But I, I do want to, yeah, we're going to talk about more about why this is important next time, I think, too. Mm. Uh, and well, just on a side, one last little note, just to bring the Mino back in, uh, and just on what you were saying, too, Dustin, um, like when we were talking about uh, Mino's paradox, um, I mean, isn't it something in a way similar is going on here too in the sense that um, you're already part of the system like you said like the like Taylor's idea of a dialogical life um, you're, you're already in it you're swimming in it you know you just gotta wake up and realize that you can half know these things because you're already part of a system um, and you can uh, you can realize some of these things because you're already within the system uh, here and you can engage it further and come become aware of it. Like, yeah, how should I say? Like, you are part of a larger system. Therefore, you can take an objective look at yourself, right? The the, the very way to represent yourself has this objective standpoint built into like language per se, right? This this kind of linguistic representation of the self from outside, right? When you when you use these words to represent yourself, like like handsome or smart or whatever, right? There's this kind of third person perspective built into it already you're kind of being undermined by your very language sometimes just bringing it back to Mino a little bit which is why I think it's so hard to simply be an egoist it's almost impossible to simply just to, to pretend like somehow that this is just you out there right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah definitely um That's about all I got for now. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I got a few more things, but I want to save it for the next time. Me too. Okay. Actually, I have some stuff I'd like to talk about too, but next time I think it will be interesting to see where this is going, how she defends it, why she thinks her viewpoint matters to society, why we should be thinking about these things. I'm looking forward to it very much. Mm. Mm, me too. Oh, and the essay was, of course, excellent. Highly recommend Susan Wolf, by the way. We didn't even mention, like, she's, what, the second woman philosopher we've had? Yeah, yeah two. All right. Uh, but, yeah, her, yeah, it was great. I think her, her essay, lecture essay, was terrific. I can't recommend it enough. Yeah. Definitely very good. 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 A lot easier to hop into than something like the Mino. Yes, I'd oh, say yes, definitely. Move, so. A nice break from our usual fare. Yes. <laughs> Very easy to read, which is like, but easy to read and yet profound and, yeah. and makes you think. Yeah, yeah. The best kind of philosophy, actually. <laughs> yeah, right. Just engaging in something like we all have a stake in, we're all thinking about, right? Wonderful. Great stuff. Yeah. We need more philosophers like her. Yes. All right. Um, unless anyone has anything else to add? No? We good? All right. Well, um, next time we'll discuss the second half of the essay. 
All right. See you.